I believe we left off chapter 9, and it was the one, two, three, four, five, about the sixth paragraph where I wanted to start. This is after he leaves the house of the ogress and discovers his shadow. And Anado says that after he's traveled for a couple of days, the next, um, the most dreadful thing of all was that I now began to feel something like satisfaction in the presence of my shadow. I began to be rather vain of my attendant, saying to myself, in a land like this, with so many illusions everywhere, I need his aid to disenchant the things around me. He does away with all appearances, shows me things in their true color and form. And I am not one to be fooled with the vanities of the common crowd. I will not see beauty where there is none. I will dare to behold things as they are. And if I live in a waste instead of a paradise, I will live knowing where I live. And on Tuesday, I brought up the, um, the character of Polyglum in C.S. Lewis's The Silver Chair. And how Polyglum says in this one scene, he would rather live in the false world of Narnia with its ideals and its beauties and its glories, or he'd rather live pretending that that world is real than live in the underworld of the evil queen with its absurdities and its horridness and its ugliness. Okay? What both authors, what Lewis and MacDonald are both dealing with there, and this figures largely in a lot of their works, um, all throughout Fantasties, MacDonald is using this, is Plato's allegory of the cave. Okay? Plato, 5th century um, BC Greek philosopher. In what Plato is doing with this idea of the allegory of the cave is he's talking about <clears throat> the world of forms or ideals and, for lack of a better way of putting it, the physical world or the world we inhabit. And what he's trying to do in this allegory is he's saying, obviously, we live here, okay? But this world is a shadow. It's not the real world, okay? The real world is this one, okay? So the real thing is up here. And what we see and what we experience, and everything about our lives is merely a shadow or a copy, okay? So he uses this image, an image of a cave, okay? And in that cave, at the back of a cave, the back of the cave, so here, there's a fire burning, a bright fire. So what does fire do when it burns? It creates light, right? <coughs> there are two sets of people in the cave. One set of people is chained to benches so they can only face one direction. They can't turn around and see behind them. So all that they see, all they experience is what they see ahead of them. And what they see ahead of them is a wall. Okay. Behind them, and they can't see these other people, they're completely unaware of their existence. Behind them, there are other people walking back and forth and carrying on their lives on, as it were, something like a platform. Okay? But again, these people are unaware of that. It's like they're deaf to what's going on back there. Okay? So, all they see is what's on the wall in front of them. Well, what is on the wall in front of them? Exactly, because this is creating light, and their shadows are being projected on that wall. Okay. 
Plato uses this allegory to say we are like these people. We are like the people who are chained to these benches. In that all we see are the shadows around us. Are the shadows real? No. They're the images of these things. So what's he getting at? He's getting at this isn't a real trash can. Right? This is an image of a trash can. Okay? Not a particular trash can. This is an image or a copy of the ideal trash can. The original form of a trash can. Every one of you has a shirt on. Okay? You can just look around the room. We've got all different kinds of shirts. We've got polos. We've got pullovers. We've got button-ups. We've got men's shirts. We've got women's shirts. Right? They're all shadows. They're all copies of the idea of shirt. So what does that idea of shirt have in it? That every one of our shirts has. That is, what are the qualities of, let's say, shirtness? Or, example Plato will use is chair. What must all chairs have? Every one of them. Exactly. A seat. Okay. Do all chairs have legs? Do you call those legs? It's a rolling chair. Ah, so they don't all have legs. Do all chairs have armrests? Nope. Do all chairs have backs? A chair without a back is called, however, a stool. But it's still a chair. Okay. So, you have all these little copies of essential chairness, right? Go back to McDonald. Notice what Anodos says in that passage. He said... I will dare to behold things as they are. He doesn't mean up in the world of forms and ideals. What does he mean? He means what we see around us is the ultimate reality. Okay? That there is no realm of forms or ideals. Plato was a student of Aristotle. Excuse me. Um, make sure I get these right. Plato was a student of Socrates. He was the teacher of Aristotle. Okay. Aristotle differed greatly from his teacher. Because while Aristotle said, yeah, this might be real, this realm of forms and ideals, we can never know it. Or, if we can, the only way we can is by examining, this is also called, up here, universals, down here, particulars. We can only know the ultimate ideals, the ultimate universals of things, by examining the particulars. By examining what? Things that we experience. That's why Aristotle was really the first scientist. He studied. He created the study, essentially, of botany, of zoology. Okay? Because he wanted to know the nature of things. So he took them apart. Why? Because he's trying to arrive ultimately at that ultimate, that ideal form. 
Okay. Anna Dose, at this point in the novel, because of the influence of his shadow, is saying there are no other ideals. There is no other reality. This is it. Period. And then you die. Okay? But, you know, we're only a third of the way through. And where is he saying this? Where is he thinking this? In what realm does he live? At this point in the novel, he's in fairyland. He's not saying this in his castle in Scotland. He's saying this in fairyland slash the other world, possibly even the world of forms and ideals. Okay? I will live knowing where I live. Kind of sounds like he's going to put down roots. He's going to fix himself in this world. So, they go on. Um... He meets the little girl with the globe. He wants to know about the globe. And he tries to take it from her. And it bursts. And she runs off crying. Okay. That's going to come up later. Um, pick up chapter 10. And we're told in the opening paragraph, about, a, oh, I don't know, maybe a third or a fourth of the way into it, he walked listlessly and almost hopelessly along. Okay. Listless means without direction. Hopeless means full of despair. Till I arrived one day at a small spring. Okay. He drinks of the spring, finds himself wonderfully refreshed. And he follows the spring wherever it goes. And it leads him to roses everywhere. And he says, Could I but see the spirit of the earth as I once saw the indwelling woman of the beech tree and my beauty of pale marble, I should be content. Content. Oh, how gladly would I die of the light of her eyes. Yea, I would cease to be if that would bring me one word of love from the one mouth. The twilight sank around and enfolded me with sleep. I slept as I had not slept for months. I did not wake till late in the morning. When refreshed in body and mind, I arose as from the death that wipes out the sadness of life and then dies itself in the new morrow. What death is he talking about? The death from this world into the next life. He's presuming, obviously, that there is a next life. Okay? What Professor Dumbledore will say at the end of the first Harry Potter novel, when Professor Dumbledore will say, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. Okay? So notice, he roses from the death that what? Wipes out the sadness of this life. In other words, refreshed, washed anew. Remember Lewis's language of his imagination having been baptized? And how MacDonald writes about the good death? Okay. We're going to see this image again and again and again. Throughout. Keep in mind, what's the title? Fantasties. Images. Okay? It's, it's not a novel in the sense that you begin at the beginning and you follow a single narrative arc to the conclusion. It's like a series of vignettes or a series of snapshots, images, series of dreams, as it were. Okay? So he keeps following the river and he sees a little boat line. He gets in the boat 
And he looks in the water, kind of seeing mirror imagery. And he starts to talk about mirrors. Why are all reflections lovelier, lovelier than what we call the reality? Notice what it's getting at right there. Because the reflection isn't real, right? When you look in the mirror, what you see in the mirror is not real. The real thing is here. Okay? Which is why if you touch your reflection in the mirror, do you feel your hand on your face? No. no. You touch your hand on your face and you feel it. You might see that in the mirror, but that's not the same. Maybe not so grand or strong, but always lovelier. All mirrors are magic mirrors. The commonest room is a room in a poem, when I turn to the glass. In other words, it's like the mirror somehow enlarges what we see. Okay? In whatever way it may be accounted for, of one thing we may be sure, that this feeling is no cheat. That is, it's not lying to us. For there is no cheating in nature in the simple unsought feelings of the soul. That is, the things that stir us down deepest. There must be a truth involved in it. Though we may but in part lay hold of the meaning. That is, we might not understand. But it has the image I put up on the board the other day of the ring of truth. There's something inside that says, okay, this is meaningful. This is powerful. This is significant. Even the memories of past pain are beautiful and past delights, though beheld only through clefts in the gray clouds of sorrows, are lovely as fairyland. But how have I wandered into the deeper fairyland of the soul, while as yet I only float towards the fairy palace of fairyland? Ah, notice what he's just done. He's juxtaposed these images with what? What is the real, the universal, the form, the ideal, other than the soul? What is the shadow, the particular, the physical, other than the body? Okay. But he's not doing this. in a Gnostic or a Manichaean sense, okay? What do I mean by those? The Gnostics were early Christian heretics who said the body isn't important. It's only the soul that's important. It's only knowledge that's important. Gnostic, the G-N-O part, we see in the modern word ignorance, right? Which ignorance means not knowing. The Gnostics were the ones who thought they knew everything. And the only way you attain immortality is through secret knowledge. And they said that secret knowledge was passed down from Jesus to them that the apostles and the disciples weren't aware of. So you have to have, you know, like little secret initiation rites and such. Okay? The Manichees said that physical material was evil. That it held us back. The Gnostics didn't quite go that far. They said it was kind of the birthing ground. So it was somewhat necessary. The Manichae said, this stuff is bad. Almost what Yoda implies in the second Star Wars film. When he says, we are not these crude material beings. We are celestial beings, he says. What does he mean by that? Beings of light. Okay? So, into the deeper fairyland of the soul, while as yet I only float, float, where? Physically, in the body. Okay? So, he floats on and he arrives at the fairy palace. And he stays there for a while. He sits down. He eats. 
And he wonders, while there, if he might somehow shake free of him. So that he should no longer be a man beside himself. He finds the pool. And the pool is made out of marble. And it's got stones in it. So it's pretty. And we're told, led by an irresistible desire. This is in the paragraph that begins, the heat of the sun soon became too intense. Led by an irresistible desire, I undressed and plunged into the water. Notice, he doesn't undress and stick his toe in the water. What's he do? Boom, he jumps in. Okay. It clothed me as with a new sense and its object both in one. The water covers him up. The waters lay so close to me they seem to enter and revive my heart. It's a little baptism image. It's like he jumps in, dead, and then his heart starts to beat. He rises to the surface, he shakes the water from his hair, and swims as in a rainbow. It's like he's suddenly seeing all the colors of the rainbow. And then with open eyes, he dives under, and he sees new things that he hadn't seen before. And he says, I thought I had been enchanted, and that when I rose to the surface, I should find myself miles from land. But no, he found himself where he was. So he rose, swam to the edge, got out easily, and then he begins to see faint, gracious forms. Why? What has happened to his sight? He's experienced a little bit of Tolkien's recovery. Were the forms there before he dove into the water? Yes, but he couldn't see them. Okay? So, to use an image from the book of Acts, it's like the scales fell off his eyes, like those that fell off Paul's eyes. And he sees things now. Okay? Third day after his arrival, he finds the library of the palace. And he spends days reading varieties of books. And notice what happens as he reads. Look at the end of that chapter. Just before the second, uh, just before the last paragraph. Okay. When he reads, mine was the whole story. What does he mean? When he reads, he becomes the central character of the story. For I took the place of the character who is most like myself, and his story was mine. Until grown weary with the life of years, condensed in an hour, or arrived at my deathbed or the end of the volume, I would awake with a sudden bewilderment to the consciousness of my present life. While reading the story, he enters that other world that Tolkien talks about as a character in the story. And if the character in that story dies, when he dies and the story ends, it's like Anodos suddenly comes back to his consciousness and is aware of himself reading a book. Recognizing the walls and roof around me and finding I joyed or sorrowed only in a book. But then he found another book. And he's not sure what kind of book this was. He says, in one with a mystical title, I read of a world that is not like ours. Whether or not it was all a poem, I cannot tell. Okay? So, he talks about what he read. I'm going to skip a whole bunch here. He talks about the children who have longing and the girls who go out and find babies. Okay? 
and how the girls, when they grow up, they don't grow arms, they grow wings. And he says in chapter 13. No, actually, I'm going to skip that. Chapter 13 is about the story of Cosmo von, Cosmo von Wester, something or other. Cosmo von Werstall, okay? Student at the University of Prague. And what's the whole story about? In this long chapter, Cosmo goes off and buys a mirror, takes the mirror home, and what does he see when he looks into the mirror? Did you guys even read it? Okay. He sees a beautiful woman, and he suddenly has a desire for this woman. Not unlike Anodos, when he looks into the marble, sees the form of the beautiful woman, sings, and releases her. Okay? Cosmo ultimately releases the woman from the spell of the mirror and dies. Okay? Go on to the next chapter. We're going to skip a bunch. Um... He goes into the room in the fairy palace. Okay, we're no longer reading the books in the library. And he sees all these people kind of standing on pedestals. And he has a dream that one night he goes into the tenth one of these rooms. There's twelve of them. That he goes into the tenth one of these rooms and he surprises the people. He catches them dancing. And he goes back to the back of the room, and he finds a pedestal, and he sees his marble lady. Okay? And he figures out how he can actually do that. He has to go and surprise the people. He has to jump into one of these rooms without premeditating it, without thinking about it. And so he does, and he frees Again, the woman of the marble. Chapter 16. Unable to restrain myself, he says in the little bit of the first paragraph, I sprang to her and in defiance of the law of the place, flung my arms around her as if I would tear her from the grasp of a visible death, lifted her from the pedestal down to my heart. No sooner had her feet touched the ground, she said, you should not have touched me, and she flees from him. Okay. I'm going to skip a bunch again. Chapter 20, uh, not chapter 20, chapter um, 18. Begins with this epigraph. From dreams of bliss shall men awake one day, but not to weep. The dreams remain, they only break, the mirror of the sleep. Okay. From dreams of bliss shall men awake one day, but not to weep. Right? Because what happens when you have a really, really fantastic, wonderful dream? You don't want to wake up. You wake up and you're like, no, let me hold on to that. Okay. So what's the dream that Jean Paul is referring to? The dream of this life. The dreams remain. They only break the mirror of sleep. In other words, it's what we call being awake. Now, that is really sleep. And we'll wake up at some point to real life. Okay? So he goes on... Um, And he says in a little short paragraph, uh, the shortest paragraph in that chapter, it's just three lines, 
I will not be tortured to death. I will meet it halfway. Okay. I will meet it halfway. What's the it? Death. Death's going to come towards me. And he's saying, I'm not going to stand there and wait. I'm going to go towards it. The life within me is yet enough to bear me up to the face of death. And then I die unconquered. That is, death will not be my slayer. Next paragraph. He walks on. And he comes to the edge of the cliff, and he just sees the raging ocean down beneath him. Okay. He goes out to the edge of it, and the waves are sweeping up to his path. And he says, I stood one moment and gazed into the heaving abyss beneath me, then plunged headlong into the mounting wave below. A blessing like the kiss of a mother seemed to alight on my soul. A calm deeper than that which accompanies a hope deferred bathed my spirit. I sank far in the waters and sought not to return. What's he mean? He jumps in. He's not swimming. He's not paddling. He's not treading water. He's just sinking. I felt as if once more the great arms of the beech tree were around me soothing me after the miseries I had passed through and telling me like a little sick child that I should be better tomorrow. The waters of themselves lifted him up until he could breathe again. Okay? Another baptism image. As he's lifted up to the surface of the ocean, he is made aware of a little boat beside him. And it's like the little boat just gently keeps tapping him until he gets inside. And he lays down in the bottom of the boat. And what does he find in it? A rich, heavy, purple cloth. Why purple? Exactly. It's the color of royalty. It's like he is a king. And he lies down and he hears the sound of the waters. And this little boat is moving fast. Soon he falls asleep, overcome with fatigue and delight, in dreams of unspeakable joy. Dreams of what? Restored friendships, revived embraces, of love which said it had never died, of faces that had vanished long ago, yet said with smiling lips that they knew nothing of the grave. That is, faces of people that had died. And yet the faces, he says, know nothing of the grave, that is, of rot and corruption, of pardons implored and granted with such bursting floods of love that I was almost glad I had sinned. Thus I passed through this wondrous twilight. I awoke with the feeling that I had been kissed and loved to my heart's content and found that my boat was floating motionless by the grassy shore of a little island. So once again, He's kind of been cleansed. He's been absolved. And he comes to this little island. Okay? And he goes inside the little cottage. And he meets the old woman. She's going to be called the wise woman of the cottage. And he comes in. He sits down beside her. He lays his head on her chest and just starts bawling. We're told, happy tears. What, what are happy tears? What kinds of tears? Okay, tears of joy. Why? Is this an image of finally being home? Of being totally accepted? She puts her arms around him and says, poor child, poor child. This is, you know, this image of motherliness that doesn't criticize, doesn't berate, doesn't punish. It's all consuming. What? Love. Okay. She gives him some food. She sings songs to him. 
Can we get a long one described? And he wakes up. He notices the fire's almost out, but it's not quite. And she has his back towards him, facing the door that he had entered. All right? And she's weeping. Then he sees her go to another door on another side of the wall, or on another wall. And when she looks at that door, she stops crying, but now she just has these deep heaving sighs. <sighs> she turns from that one to the third door. And a cry as of fear or suppressed brain pain breaks from her. And then she turns to the fourth door and she just shudders and stands still as a statue. She comes to him, comes towards him, she builds up the fire. And he wants to go out the door that he came through. And she says, before you go, one, you're not going to see what you expect to see when you go out that door. What does he expect to see? The island and the little boat. Okay. But she says, remember this mark? And she shows him a mark on her hands. And she says, remember this mark? Okay. And whenever you wish to come back to me, enter wherever you sit. It's like, okay. She kisses him. He goes out. What does he experience? Okay, remember, this is which door? This is the door of sighs. Excuse me, this is the door of tears. It's the one he came in. Okay? What does he experience? His childhood. He and his favorite brother had a fight. Okay? Their last words to each other were not kind or nice. The brother got up earlier than he did in the morning, had gone to bathe in the river, and drowned. So his last words to his favorite brother were words of harshness, not of love. And then his brother drowned. Okay? He rushes out of the house sighing, crying bitterly, bitterly. He runs to the barn, the family barn. Okay. He looks at the mark. He doesn't remember it. But he goes inside the barn to go to sleep. And he enters the door, and he's back at her cottage. He throws himself on the couch, falls asleep while she sings. He gets up, and he goes through the door of sighs. And where is he? He's in a magnificent hall. And there is the marble lady. The one he loves. And here comes <clears throat> Sir Percival. Now, not all rusty. Now, shining. And Percival says, I am sad when I think of the youth whom I met twice in the forest of Fairyland, and who you say twice with his songs roused you from the death sleep of an evil enchantment. There was something noble in him, but it was a nobleness of thought and not of deed. He may yet perish of vile fear. What was it that came to him when he opened the cupboard door in the ogre's house. What was the shadow? Fear. Do we see him experience real fear before then? No. no, we don't. Even with the ash, he boldly goes. Okay? It's fear and doubt. Okay? And she says, you saved him once, and for that I thank you. For may I not say that I somewhat loved him? 
tell me how you fared. And so the knight says, I went and fought the ash tree, and I realized, earthly arms availed not against such as he. Meaning, swords and weapons. So if earthly arms won't avail creatures like the ash, what will? Naked strength. Okay. So he kills the ash tree. And the knight says, but dost thou love the youth still? How can I help it, she says. He woke me from worse than death. He loved me. It was his love that woke her out of her enchantment. I had never been for thee if he had not sought me first. In other words, it's only after Anodos wakes her from the marble tomb that she runs into and meets Sir Percival. She isn't his lover before then. Okay? But I love him not as I love thee. He was but the moon of my night. Thou art the sun of my day. And Anodos thinks, okay, let me have the nights then. Let him have the day. Because they can't hear anything he says. They sit silent. Okay. Anodos is sitting right near her. And she's totally unaware of his presence. He goes through the door where he sees the sign. Actually, he, um, yeah, he goes back to the cottage, jumps back on the couch, hears the woman singing. He gets up again. This time he walks through the door of dismay. And he goes out into a street crowded with people. Okay. And he discovers, when he goes into a new room, he's in the church. But it's not just any church. It's the church where all his family is buried. Not out in the churchyard, but in the vault beneath the church. And he says to the dead, If any of the dead are moving here, let them take pity upon me. For I, alas, am still alive, and let some dead woman comfort me, for I am a stranger in the land of the dead and see no light. He feels a kiss. Okay? He gropes his way farther on. And he finds his way into the cottage again. And he hears the old woman singing. We weep for gladness, weep for grief. The tears, they are the same. We sigh for songing and relief. The sighs have but one name. And mingled in the dying strife are moans that are not sad. The pangs of death are throbs of life. Its sighs are sometimes glad. The face is very strange and white. It is earth's only spot that feebly, feebly flickers back to light. The living seeth not. Okay. What's the light that the living seeth not? It's the light beyond the door of death. When he awakes, he finds that she has moved. She's now standing in front of the door of timelessness. She says, don't go there. But he does. He knew nothing more. Okay. He wakes up, and he's back in the cottage. And what's going to shortly happen to the cottage? The ocean will rise and will cover it. But she says, I have enough wood to keep the fire going for a long time. The waters will rise and stay over for only a year. And then they'll recede again. But she says, you can leave. It's not actually an island. It's a peninsula. You can run across the little isthmus, and you'll be safe. Okay, so he does. And who does he run into? The two brothers getting ready to fight the giants. Why are they going to fight the giants? Because the giants are terrorizing their father's kingdom. Their father is the king. He gets there, and they call him brother. They've had a vision that he would join them. Okay. Okay. 
and he joins him, he makes his own armor. Chapter 21. I put my life in my hands. The epigraph. The morning that they're going to go out and challenge the giants. That is, they're going to go to the giant's castle, fully armed and armored, with the armor they have each made. What do the giants do? They come to their castle. So they have to fight the giants unprotected. And Anodos, we're told, kills his giant. The other two brothers killed their giants, but they die in the process. So he goes and tells the townspeople. They rescue all the captives of the giants, and they take the two brothers with their prey, their giants, off to the king, their father. And he leaves the king, and we get chapter 22. Third day now after leaving the king. He runs, he meets a youth, and the youth says, Sir Knight, be careful as thou ridest through this forest, for it is said to be strangely enchanted, and a sort which even those who have been witness of its enchantment can hardly describe. And Anatos thinks, the moment I entered the wood, it seemed to me that if enchantment there was, it must be of a good kind. For the shadow, which had been more than usually dark and distressing me since I had set out on this journey, suddenly disappeared. In other words, doubt and fear are gone. I felt a wonderful elevation of spirits. And what does he start to think? I'm pretty good. I killed a giant. I'm like one of those knights of old, one of those giant killers. Okay? And what immediately, or nearly so, happens? He's on a narrow path. He's riding on along. And he sees another knight coming. And he tells the other knight, let me pass. And the other knight says, when I will. That is, when I wish to, when I desire to. And suddenly, Anados loses all courage. He's thinking, I need to put my lance in my elbow. I need to couch my lance and charge this guy. And he can't. And the knight just says, follow me. Meaning, coward. Do what I say. And he does. And he leads him off to his tower. And he goes in. And he has dreams in this tower. But he also notices when the moon rises, and when the moon shines through the one window and hits him, suddenly the walls of the tower disappear. Okay. A couple days go by. And he hears a voice singing outside, and he goes up to the door, <laughs> and it opens. In other words, what was the tower? What imprisoned him? Somebody else? No. Himself. He's a prisoner of his own mind. And he sees a woman. And she says, were you the prisoner there? Do you know me then? Do you not know me? You hurt me. And maybe that's why you forget. You broke my globe. This is the woman who had been the little girl. Yet I thank you. Perhaps I owe you many thanks for breaking it. Why? Because she took the pieces. She went back to the fairy queen. And she says, there was no music and no light in them. But she took them from me laid them aside, and made me go to sleep in a great hall of white with black pillars and many red curtains. Where was that? In the fairy palace. That's the hall he had been in, where he had seen 
the dancers. When I woke in the morning, I went to her, hoping to have my globe again, whole and sound, but she sent me away without it, and I have not seen it since. And notice, nor do I care for it now. Why? Because it was unimportant. It was all part of the shadow of her previous life. I have something so much better. I do not need the globe to play to me. Why? Because now she can sing. She's in tune, as it were, with her own soul. And now, she says, wherever I go, her songs do good. They do what? They free people. They deliver people. What was he delivered from? The tower? Or from his own fear and doubt and self-loathing? Okay. He asks for her forgiveness. She says, there's nothing to forgive. I thank you. So he goes on. And he takes all of his armor off. I stripped off, just before chapter 23, I stripped off all my armor, piled it under the tree just where the lady had been seated, took my own known way eastward through the woods. He only carries his axe. And he thinks to himself, Then first I knew the delight of being lowly. That is, for the first time in his life, he understands the delight of being lowly. Lowly. He doesn't mean being bad. He just means not having a high opinion of himself, of being ordinary. Okay? Keep in mind, what happens to him on his 21st birthday? He gets his father's inheritance, which includes what? A castle. So he's not poor. Okay? And he says to himself, I am what I am, nothing more. I have failed. I have lost myself. Would it had been my shadow. That is, I wish it had been my shadow that I lost. I learned that it is better a thousandfold for a proud man to fall and be humbled than to hold up his head in his pride and fancied innocence, fancied, imagined, pretend. I learned that he that will be a hero will barely be a man. That he that will be nothing but a doer of his work is sure of his manhood. What does that mean? A doer of his work. It's not all deep it's, it's, I mean, the, the answer to that question is not some deep theological or philosophical thing. It's very, very ordinary and common. He that would be a doer of his work, how does he say it? Is sure of his manhood. What's his work? The things he has to do. Period. It might be putting gas in your car. It might be writing a paper. It might be showing up for class. It might be doing your job well. It might be saying hello to somebody. That's what he's talking about. Doing the work. Whatever it is you have to do next. In nothing was my ideal lowered or dimmed or grown less precious. That is, he doesn't still have ideals. I only saw it too plainly to set myself for a moment beside it. Indeed, my ideal soon became my life. His life becomes the most important thing. And I don't mean most important in the sense that he's not willing to lose it. Okay? Whereas formerly my life had consisted in a vain attempt to behold, if not my ideal in myself, at least myself in my ideal. That I was this high-born, powerful, influential person, is what he's talking about. Now, however, I took at first what 
perhaps was a mistaken pleasure in despising and degrading myself. That is, now, when he reaches this point of humility, now he kind of goes the other end of the pendulum. And he degrades and despises himself. Another self seemed to rise like a white spirit from a dead man, from the dumb and trampled self of the past. Doubtless, this self must again die and be buried, and again from its tomb spring a winged child. What does he mean? That this self must die and rise again and die and rise again and die and rise again. Keep in mind, McDonald's a Christian. He who would find his life must lose his life, Christ says, for my sake. Does that mean once? No. You must deny yourself and take up your cross. Does that mean once? No. It means every time that desire for something else comes up. Self will come to life even in the slaying of self, but there is ever something deeper and stronger than it which will emerge at last from the unknown abysses of the soul. What MacDonald is talking about, which is related to some of this, is this idea that none of us really is yet. We are all in the process of becoming. Okay? We are all, to use a somewhat trite image, we are all like that caterpillar in the cocoon. We are going through the process of metamorphosis. We are going through the process of becoming what the caterpillar is meant to be, a butterfly or a moth. Okay. Will it be as a solemn gloom, burning with eyes, or a clear morning after the rain? So, he goes on, and who does he run into? Percival, okay, and he sees Percival, Percival's dra dragging the dragon, his horse is, and he has rescued a child, takes the child to its mother and father, and a few pages in, a couple pages in, the knight says, when Anodos offers to be his squire because he says, here is someone worthy to be served. Where in the rest of the book has Anodos tried to serve somebody else? Why did he wake the woman from the alabaster? Because he loved her. He wanted her. He desired her. He didn't raise her for her well-being. He didn't free her for her well-being. He did it for himself. Okay? Why did Cosmo finally break the mirror? To release the woman from the spell. That was not a selfish act. That was a selfless act. Okay? So, the knight says, Somehow or other, notwithstanding the beauty of this country of fairy in which we are, there is much that is wrong with it. That is... Something is wrong in the land of fairy. In, if there are great splendors, there are corresponding horrors, heights and depths, beautiful women and awful fiends, noble men and weaklings. All a man has to do is to better what he can. Notice, does a man have to fix all the problems? What does he have to do? Exactly. Fix the problems that he can. What does that mean? Think of what I talked about on Tuesday. You know, the incident in California. 
you had a half dozen or a dozen students watching while a blind kid is getting the crap beaten out of them. Watched. They didn't do a thing to stop it. One kid did. He did what he could to make the world a better place. And if he will settle it with himself, that even renown and success are in themselves of no great value. That is, success is of no great value. What is McDonald saying? It doesn't matter if you succeed. What's important? That you tried. That you tried. And be content to be defeated. If so be that the fault is not his. That is, if you are defeated, it's not necessarily your fault. If you are outpowered, outnumbered. And so, go to his work with a cool brain and a strong will. He will get it done, and fare none the worse in the end, that he was not burdened with provision and precaution. Anodos. But he may not always come off well. Yeah, but he might not succeed, he means. He might not do a good job. The night, perhaps not. In the individual act. But the result of his lifetime will content him. What does he mean? Yeah, maybe you do 2,000 things in your life. And maybe 500 of those, you totally fail. Or maybe 1,200 of those, you fail. What the knight says is, taken all together, what? It is a successful life. It's like that image I used the other day of the tapestry. Maybe from the underside of the tapestry, meaning life as we live it, all we see are like the backside of a tapestry. A bunch of loose threads sticking out that don't make any sense. You go up on the other side of the tapestry and you see this beautiful image. Okay. Like what's the difference between wearing a shirt right side out or inside out? Okay. And Anadose says, that's what your life's going to be like. You will end up contented. But he's thinking, but for me, I'm a loser. Okay. So, they go on, and uh, this is about, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, six paragraphs before the end of the chapter. Fairly long paragraph that begins, it was a great space, bare of trees. They go on, they make their way, and Anodos has just said to himself, this is a good man, I will serve him. And they come to a road. Branches have been cut down, openings made, it's an obvious real path. And they start to see people making their way up this path. And the looks of everybody was kind of directed towards what was at the end. But Anodos notices it was growing dark within. That is where this multitude of people was. And it grew darker and darker. The night says, how solemn it is. Surely they wait to hear the voice of a there is something good near. But Anodos thinks, no. I, though somewhat shaken by the feeling expressed by my master, yet had an unaccountable conviction that he was something bad. So how could the knight think this must be something wonderful and glorious, and yet Anodos think this is something bad? What does he ascribe to the knight for his thought? He can't conceive of something bad like this, okay? 
And so they see the star rise over the temple, and it illuminates it. And they see these men dressed in white, take somebody forward, and the person disappears. And they see this happen again and again. More convinced than before, beginning of a, of a paragraph, that there was evil here, I could not endure that my master should be deceived, that one like him, so pure and noble, should respect. But if my suspicions were true, it was worse than the ordinary deceptions of priestcraft. Okay. So he sees a little girl beside him, and he asks if he could borrow her overshirt, like a white robe. And she said, sure. Okay. He gives her his axe. He takes her robe. And he goes on up ahead. And we're told the middle of the next paragraph. But instead of kneeling at its foot, that is, when he gets up to the platform, I walked right up to the stairs to the throne, laid hold of a great wooden image that sit, seemed to sit upon it, tried to hurl it from its seat. But he couldn't at first, because it was too firmly fixed. But in dread, lest the first shock of amazement passing away, the guards would rush upon me before I had effected my purpose. I strained with all my might, and with a noise as of cracking and breaking and tearing of rotten wood, something gave way and he hurled the image down the steps. In other words, he's just thrown down like a false god or a false idol. Its displacement revealed a great hole in the throne, like the hollow of a decayed tree. Think the ash, think the alder. But I had no time to examine it, for as I looked into it, up out of it rushed a great brute like a wolf, but twice the size, and tumbled me headlong with itself down the steps of the throne. As we fell, however, I caught it by the throat, and the moment we reached the platform, a struggle commenced in which I soon got uppermost with my hand upon its throat and knee upon its heart. All right. He hears swords coming out of their scabbards, and he loses consciousness. Chapter 24. We are ne'er like angels till our passions die. Passions doesn't just mean desires. Okay. And then we have a quote by Cooley. This wretched inn where we scarce stay to bait, we call our dwelling place. We call one step a race. This precious inn is our body. But angels in their full enlightened state, angels who live and know what it is to be, that is, not to be in the process of becoming, but to be, who all the nonsense of our language see, who speak things and our words, their ill-drawn pictures scorn, when we, by a foolish figure, say, Behold an old man dead. They say, Speak properly and cry, Behold a man-child born. I was dead and right content. He's dead and what? Happy. Okay. I lay in my coffin, my hands folded in peace. The knight and the lady weeping over him. And the lady says, he has died well. He has died well. Well, see, our society tends to say, tends to believe, tends to preach. You can't die well, because all death is bad, which is why we flee from it. Anodos, my spirit rejoiced. My soul was like a summer evening after a heavy fall of rain, when the drops are yet glistening on the trees and the last rays of the down-going sun and the wind of the twilight has begun to blow. Notice the image. Okay? A shimmering summer evening. It's been raining. But now the rain is gone and the sun is shining as it sets. Everything is coated with raindrops. And the sun is now shining on everything. What is it doing? 
there's a light scattered everywhere. The hot fever of life had gone by, and I breathed the clear mountain air of the land of death. I had never dreamed of such blessedness. It was not that I had in any way ceased to be what I had been. The very fact that anything can die implies the existence of something that cannot die, which must either take to itself another form, like the caterpillar and the butterfly, or as the seed that is sown dies and rises again, or in conscious existence may perhaps continue to lead a purely spiritual life. If my passions were dead, passions are the powers of the body, hunger, lust, desire. Those essential mysteries of the spirit, which had embodied themselves in the passions, and had given to them all their glory and wonderment, yet lived. That is, the eternal things that the passions themselves are shadows of. They lived, they glowed, a pure undying fire. Okay? So they put the coffin in the ground, and they stand there and weep over him, and Anado says, I rose into a single large primrose that grew by the edge of the grave. That is, his spirit comes up into this flower because the marble lady is right next to it. And he looks her full in the face. And the flower catches her eye. She stoops and she plucks the flower and says, Oh, you beautiful creature. And she kisses it and she sticks it in her bosom, we're told. But what happens to a flower? What happens to a flower once you pick it? It starts to die. Okay? He goes on. And we're told in the middle of that next paragraph. I knew now that it is by loving and not by being loved that one can come nearest the soul of another. What's he mean? What are you doing when you love someone else? Does the love stay locked up in here? No. You're giving yourself away, right? Isn't that why it's so dangerous to say those words, I love you? Because what's... A possible reply. I don't. <laughs> you know, and that, you know, that whole imaginary image just poof, goes away. Okay? So, it is by loving and not by being loved that one can come nearest the soul of another. Yea, that we're to love, it is the loving of each other and not the being loved by each other that originates and perfects and assures their blessedness. To put that in more modern language. A marriage isn't 50-50. It's 100-100. And it doesn't matter what the other person does. You give 100%. Period. Okay? I knew that love gives to him that loveth Power over any soul, beloved, even if that soul know him not. And he's not talking about control. Lost my place. Bringing him inwardly close to that spirit, a power that cannot be but for good. For in proportion as selfishness intrudes, the love ceases. So if the love for somebody else is because of my desire to be fulfilled, to be completed, or anything like that, the love for that other person declines. Yet all love will one day meet with its return. That is, one day all loves will be reciprocated. Doesn't mean my love for my wife. It's not what he's talking about. 
or love for a, of a mother for a child. He means all loves, little l, will one day be returned by capital L, by love itself, in the eyes of the beloved and be humbly glad. All right? And his chariot bears him up into the sky and over a great city, and he hears noise. And he thinks to himself, Soon as my senses have all come back and have grown accustomed to this new blessed life, I will be among you with the love that healeth. He is thinking of all the suffering people in this great city. And he's saying, I will love you. I will help you. And with that, what happens? He wakes up. Remember a Christmas carol? It's when Scrooge sees his tomb and comes to himself that he comes to himself and wakes up and says, I will keep Christmas past, present, and future every day. Our life is no dream, Novalis, but it ought to become one and perhaps will. And you were told, sinking from such a state of ideal bliss into the world of shadows, which again closed around and enfolded me. My first dread was that my own shadow had found me once again. And he wakes up, and where is he? He's on a hilltop, and he's looking down into a valley. It's still nighttime. The sun hasn't come up. And when the star sun starts to come up, he looks behind him, and he sees a huge shadow. And he thinks his shadow has indeed come back. Until he realizes, nope, it's just my earthly shadow caused by the sun. He goes home. He greets his sisters. And they tell him, on the morning of his 21st birthday, they went to his bedroom, or the day after. They went to his bedroom and they found his bedroom was flooded. Notice, his bedroom wasn't out in the wild. The walls hadn't disappeared, but the floor was flooded. And he disappeared for 21 days. And he says, it seemed like 21 years. Could I translate the experience of my travels there into common life? Could I translate what I experienced in fairyland into life here? This was the question. Or must I live it all over again and learn it all over again? That is, must I do what I did in Fairyland, here. Not the same way. Why? Because we don't have ash tree ogres in this world. Are there other ogres? Yes. Or must I live it all over again and learn it all over again? In the other forms that belong to the world of men, whose experience what? Runs parallel to the realm of Fairyland. Seeming to suggest that what happens in fairyland, well, it affects what happens here. Thus, I, who set out to find my ideal, that is, when he went into fairyland, on his 21st birthday, came back rejoicing that I had lost my shadow. Ideal, shadow, form, copy. Did he find his ideal? Well, he kind of experienced it. And we're told, very last, As I lay with my eyes closed, he began to listen to the sound of the leaves overhead. Why? He'd been out with the reapers, and he falls asleep under a beech tree. 
And he hears the music of the leaves as the wind blows through them. And gradually he hears words, till at last I seemed able to distinguish these, half dissolved in a little ocean of circumfluent tones. A great good is coming, is coming, is coming to thee, Anodos. What is the great good? Listen to what he says. He opens his eyes, and for a moment he thinks he saw the old woman of the cottage's face. But it's not, it's just the tree. Yet I know that good is coming to me, that good is always coming, though few have at all times the simplicity and the courage to believe it. What we call evil is the only and best shape which for the person and his condition at the time could be assumed by the best good. And so farewell. What does he mean? What we call evil is the only and best shape which could be assumed by the best good. He means what we think of as evil happening to us personally, individually, I don't mean as a country or as a world, is the only form that good can take for us at that time. Now, that is a hard pill to swallow if you believe it or if you accept it. Okay? How can getting cancer be good? How can getting mugged be good? How can being raped be good? How can think of evils? How can getting a bad grade be good? Well, getting a bad grade isn't like being raped, right? <laughs> but is it possible in both situations to learn something from them? And I'm not talking about wearing the wrong clothes or anything like that. Okay? But yes, it is. That's what he's getting at. And this idea that he's talking about that is foreign to us, and that is foreign almost entirely to the modern Christian church entirely, was commonplace among the early church. I mean, the early church fathers up to about 1000 AD essentially say, Whatever happens is for our good. It all depends on what. How we perceive it and what we learn from it. Keep going. One last thing. What does Anodos learn in fairyland? Is it enough to simply know? You have to act. So it's our perspective and what we learn and how we respond, how we act as a result. Okay, we'll stop there.